my welcome. I'm Simone Witcha. I'm the director of the Blanton Museum of Art, and I thank you for coming here to this special program tonight to launch the opening of the Blanton's presentation of Vincent Valdez's A City. I want to extend a, a special welcome to the students of UT and of Houston Tillotson who are here tonight. <laughs> Vincent Valdez is committed to exploring some of the most persistent, persistent and challenging social issues of our day. The Blanton has been following his career for several years and has been proud to acquire and display his work since 2015. The two paintings we acquired then were from his series, The Strangest Fruit, which explores the history of lynching of Mexican and Mexican Americans in Texas. Expanding knowledge and human understanding is a core value at this university, and it is central to our mission here at the Blanton. Great works of art prompt complex inquiries, and Vincent's work, The City, does exactly that. I grew up listening to my mother talk about how her Arab grandfather, who lived in Mexico, was often hidden in the chimneys of their home in order to escape the anti-immigrant raids there. And hearing my mother's own story as a Mexican immigrant to the US herself, while trying to go home with her newborn, fair-skinned daughter, my sister, the hospital will not let her leave without tags. They required my father to show up to prove that she was in fact the mother. And of people's reactions, as they would see them together as a family, sometimes assuming my mom was the nanny. My father's own stories of, of escaping Poland at the height of World War II, leaving behind his Jewish grandparents that he loved, as a young child walking with his mother through Germany to Switzerland, just to arrive to a community that was unsympathetic to immigrants and refugees. These stories make up part of who I am. They taught me about discrimination and intolerance and perseverance. But at the end of the day, they really only taught me to be sympathetic. Because no matter what your story is, none of us can truly understand the challenges and the pain of other people's experiences. But we can listen. Talking about race is complicated. Vincent's work and others in our galleries force us to confront uncomfortable questions. Talking about racism is confusing. You're bound to make mistakes. I've made my share. And I'll be honest, I'm going to make more because I'm going to keep trying. A person who I deeply admired told me during this process, you can't keep, you can't, you have to keep trying even when it's hard because if you give up, nothing changes. Preparing for this project has been a significant undertaking, which has included so many people on this campus and in this community. Led by our thoughtful and capable curator, Veronica Roberts, and our educators, Ray William, Shabon McCusker, and Sabrina Phillips. They worked with faculty members from across this campus who've shared their expertise and insights to help support how we present and how they can think about teaching from this work of art. Several of these faculty members are here tonight, and I thank you. The Austin chapter of the Anti-Defamation League and the Austin Independent School District have been working with the Blanton educators to produce teaching materials around the Blanton's collection and that are used district-wide. The lesson plan produced for this year, for this work of art, the city, are now also being distributed nationally by the Anti-Defamation League. At various times throughout this process of bringing people together, of thinking and talking through the tough questions prompted by this work, I thought of Vincent alone in his studio. I thought about him creating and confronting this work on his own, not with a hundred people to talk to for almost a year. I also thought about the bravery it took for him to put it out there in the world, for us to analyze, to talk about, to pick at. I greatly admire the courage of artists like you, Vincent, and like Deborah Roberts and Adriana Coral and other artists who are here tonight. 
who put your voices out there. It is the bravery of artists that bring us to work every day at the Blanton. And the world needs more people with courage like you, Vincent. Vincent Valdez was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1977 and currently lives and works in Houston. He received a full scholarship to RISD and has been the recipient of many grants and residencies. His work is included in museum collections internationally. Maria Hinojosa is the anchor and executive producer of the long-running weekly NPR show, Latino USA. For 25 years, she's helped tell America's untold stories and brought to light the unsung heroes in this country and abroad. As the anchor of the Emmy Award-winning talk show, Maria Hinojosa, One on One, and a rotating anchor for Need to Know, she has informed millions of Americans about the fastest growing population in the country and reported on countless important stories. It is such an honor to have you here to lead our first public conversation about the city. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the talk. So please hold your inquiries and keep them till then. But for now, please welcome Vincent Valdez and Maria Hinojosa. What's up, Vincent? <laughs> How What's you up, doing? Maria? What's up? Oh, there's a little crowd of you out there. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's more. Than, I'm glad nobody had anything else to do tonight. Thank you for coming. <laughs> I know, on such a particularly cool night in Texas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's great to be here. I um I was saying that it's kind of, you know, I I actually as. Well, you actually don't know this. I'm on the plane. I'm on a plane all the time. So I don't actually say yes to traveling on planes, especially in the summer, um, and especially to Texas. Um, but I'm, I'm married to an artist, and um, I believe so strongly in, the, in, in artists and artists' work. And so I think that something just kind of struck me when I got the invitation to come down here. I um, mean, it was kind of your dream, so. It was my dream, so thank you for making my dream come true. So you just <laughs> like, I don't know what you did, a little bit of like, woo! <laughs> You're like, I'm gonna send her like a potion. <laughs> um, and I didn't really quite know exactly what I was walking into, so thank you for the controversy. You had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, and so I guess, you know, I'm gonna ask you a question because there is, uh, and I was talking about this with my husband, an artist who does the opposite of what you do. So you're hyper-realism and he's like Caribbean Chagall. You know, could not be more different. And yet we were, we were talking about your piece, you know, and, um, and he's glad that you did it and I am too. But there was a moment when I just thought, pero, pero como fue? Like, how did you like, you know, what struck you to just say, I'm gonna paint this painting? Yeah, yeah, sure. What was it? that just kind of took you over and said, now this is the painting. How, can you just take us to that moment, that artistic moment that I'm sure you had? When and how and, yeah, why do you think? Sure, I, um, in 2015 in the fall, I, uh, you know, I felt a sense of outrage um, as I normally do in the studio. Um, and I felt that the image, the, the visual, the, premon the premonition that I had in my head was um, the, the elephant in the room. Why was nobody talking about this? The idea of white supremacy and racism in this country was everywhere that I looked outside of the studio. Like, what do you mean? Well, it, in it infected all of America. Well, no, no, no. I mean, Wait. People think, I I'm like, no, actually, I need you to say for you. Sure. When you say, I walk out in the world and I see white supremacy being reflected back, I need you to actually name that. Sure. Because you were doing that when we had a president named Barack Obama. Sure. So you were talking about that you were feeling this stuff. So, yeah, I need you to actually name for me when you talk about white supremacy. What are you talking about? Well, it's very evident to me um, throughout my lifetime the distorted social realities that I encounter in the world outside of the studio. Um, you know, when I think about 
mass incarceration, uh, economic inequality, uh, segregated cities in the 21st century, uh, biased justice systems, police brutality, broken education systems, um, the military industrial complex, um, the delivering of democracy to third world countries wrapped up in bombs. You know, these are issues that um, for me serve as prelude for democratic and social decay. And in 2015, I felt like I had had enough. But I also was very aware of artists like who, predecessors who had come before me uh, in the art history pillars of America, artists like Philip Gustin with his image from 1969 titled City Limits, artists like Thomas Hart Benton, Charles White, John Biggers, Kerry James, Marshall, uh, and so forth. Um, here was my opportunity to stand up and to speak up. Um, and so it took me 11 months to create the city from start to finish. Can you just talk about the moment when you visualized it? Because, you know, the name of the piece is the city, but of course, and that's, you know, we see it in the background. Um, the piece is not KKK in your face. Sure. The piece is the city. So, but you obviously had a visual moment. Can you just take me to that moment when you were like, and this is what I wanted to look like? What was that? Why was this the image that came up for you? Well, I think that one of the issues that I find, um, you know, when I step back and observe um, my, ex my American experience is that it's been, it's for, for far too long, it's been too easy for America to avoid the conversation uh, about racism um, and how it is so embedded in our American DNA and our way of life. And so I knew that I wasn't interested in creating a uh, predictable, um, violent image of the, of the Ku Klux Klan uh, and its victims because I felt that um, there was nothing that I, I felt that there was n no fresh perspective in that. I'm yeah, even though you understand like the pain of that particular piece of art that depicts that. Absolutely, absolutely. But and you were saying I want to do something that is... I wanted to do something that not only stood in, solitar in, in sol um, uh, solidarity, thank you, um, with my black brothers and sisters, with Native Americans, um, with, with Americans of color, uh, and any American who has been willing to confront the subject of racism in this country, but I wanted to push my envelope in terms of widening my panoramic scope if you will, so I tend to see, I was seeing an HD before HD was ever a thing, right? And so I, um, I wanted to further examine how the idea of white supremacy expands, m goes much further than just the Ku Klux Klan. You know, and again, I was thinking about ideas of like, even just the way the cities are designed, right? Because when you think about, I mean, most, most Americans don't think about on a daily walk or when you're driving home from work, you know, things like, small things like the placement of parks and trees in, in different neighborhoods. Who gets trees and parks, right, and playgrounds? Who gets access to these things? Where are the uh, housing projects and ghettos placed in cities, right? Where are liquor stores placed? Where are um, county jails placed? You're basically, what you're talking about is things like structural racism. There right? is such a thing as overt and covert racism. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, in, in part, and by the way, Vincent, can't we do sure. the thing? Yeah, you know, that see. thing? I, mean, I, I might have to control. We'll you know where way. it's like doing the thing? Sure. Okay. <laughs> the slideshow. <laughs> right where it was automatically doing it, right? Yeah, I probably have to flip, but I can, I'm, okay. I can maintain both. All right, both, just because, yeah. you know, we want a little bit of variation. Um, <laughs> oh, see, this is my favorite. And we were talking about this. Well, okay, since this one came up, you're, you're 10 years old here? I'm 10 years old. Okay. Uh -huh. And so your painting, uh, I mean, immediately it recognizes, and they were like, you were like murals. Sure. Um, so street art, public art, art that's accessible, art that is, in, in Spanish, contestatario, art that is giving, you know, that is asking for an answer, art that is... Um, in some ways directly political and in other ways is is just beautiful art sure. um, art that is a you know muralistic art that is central to the Mexican experience absolutely so all of this is part of who Vincent the artist is 
Absolutely. I mean, I, so I started as a muralist when I was about nine or 10 years old in San Antonio. But for me, I mean, it's perfect in terms of talking about um, examining and identifying, being aware, developing a consciousness about how, how far and deep this, the idea of uh, racism extends into our communities and in our cities and eventually across um, general America. Wait, you were, you were feeling that when you were 10? Well, when I was 10 years old, I started working on these murals in housing projects in the west side of San Antonio Got it. with a fellow artist um, who was older than me at that time and took me under his wing. And it was the first real education that I had ever had because it really taught me to, to see how to really look, how to step back and remain at the edges of the world in order to observe it consciously. And it really woke me up in the, term, in the sense that I saw that there were differences in various communities, right? Even in San Antonio, San Antonio is still in the year 2018, I think it's the second most segregate, economically segregated city in the nation. Whoa. And it's dominantly a Mexican-American city. I was going to say, it's city, a majority right? Latino sure. city, so we got some situation going on. Sure. And so, you know, I think it was Cesar Chavez who once said, um, once you learn to see, you can never learn to unsee, right? You, um, these pieces, um, Strangest Fruit? Strangest Fruit. Um, so I, I've come to have an understanding that I'm, I'm, a little bit obsessed with what happened during World War II, actually, sure. with the Nazi era. Um, I'm, I'm a little obsessed. Like, once I realize that, I, and it's, of course, something I'm, I'm working out in the present, I almost feel like there's something about you, you know, this issue of white supremacy, because you have done these of strangest fruit, lynchings of um, people of color, predominantly Latinos, predominantly Mexicans, um, your piece with the with now the city and um, tell us what, you know, do you feel like it's a little bit of an obsession? Is it a, what is it? Am I wrong? And is it like, a, is it the social justice obsession? It's, it's, the, it's the, the obsession of injustice in this country. For me, it really is giving, it's my way of giving platform to the n narratives that are untold and invisible in this country. Because if there's one thing that Americans are excel at, it's at forgetting our history. Um, but, you know, I find no, I, it's hard to find fault in, in common citizens in this country because we are not condi conditioned in this country to know and learn our true history. We are not conditioned to think critically in the school systems. And there's a reason for this. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's always my favorite quote from Gore Vidal, American writer, playwright, who once said, uh, we are the United States of amnesia. We learn nothing because we remember nothing. And that, if that ever rang true today, it, it's the truest of all, right? And, um, and so these images for me, my mission in the studio is, um, is to hold up a reflective mirror because I think that um, there's one thing that America in the 21st century has yet to come to terms with, and it's the truth. The truth of, we're, we're caught in a, we're trapped between the myth of who we think we were and the reality of who we really are. So I, you and I have actually never talked ab about this, but um, I, I'm assuming that you know that hate crimes against Latinos are, are spiking. Um, in some states even doubling. Um, and I don't know how much you know about kind of white supremacist organizations like the KKK and what they've been doing over the past, you know, 18 years or so in terms of new recruitments. Do you know about that? No, not, not so much. So um, basically what they've done since 9-11, um, there's really been an, an uptick in reasons for why um, white supremacist organizations um, or the KKK, how they can do recruitment, right? 9-11 happened, and so there was really an anti-Muslim tone oh, that was sure, taken. Sure. There was a, a pretty quick turn that was, that was taken, though, in the early 2000s um, to actually very specifically go after anti-Latino, anti-immigrant right. rhetoric in order to increase their ranks. So that's why I'm thinking about the work that you're doing and the fact that, in fact, 
the targeting of hatred towards Latinx communities is actually something that has been done strategically and structurally, to sure. use your term. Sure, and it's not something that is of the moment, right? I mean, you can, if you, it doesn't take, you don't have to dig very far back to, to realize that the militarization of the border stretches back to the early 1900s, right? That the war and the fear-mongering of immigrants, um, Latino immigrants in this country, stretches um, equally as far back, if not further. And so the idea with a series like The Strangest Fruit was um, in respect to the poem Strange Fruit by Abel Maripol in 1939, I believe he wrote it, um, you know, this, this already very dark and sinister history in America about the lynching of um, my fellow black and uh, um, brothers and sisters in this country, you know, it's something that hasn't ended. You know, they are still at the receiving end of, brutal, of brutality in this country. But if you just go even further, it's overwhelming to think that, again, an already um, barbaric subject expands even wider, right? And so in this case, it was important to depict these, um, the lens of this subject through 21st, contemporary, 21st century contemporary brown males. You know, when I think about the various clothing, the, the baggy jeans, the hairstyles, the tennis shoes, all of, the, all of which serve as crosshairs, markers for the crosshairs, right? So again, I'm thinking about the idea of the invisible noose, right? The noose no longer exists in this country. But if you just stop for a moment and ask yourself, well, has the noose really uh, disappeared? How has it been reshaped, resold, and repackaged to the American people? through oppressive, systematic forms like mass incarceration, the war on immigration, stop and frisk programs, racial profiling, gang curfews, right? Think about the term MS-13 right now and how everybody's supposed to jump because they are coming for all of us, right? And so the idea of creating these figures on blank backgrounds, their backgrounds have been entirely erased, no history, no sense of place, it's easy to sell a deal like the American myth when you have no history, right? And so the idea here is that the tighter, um, the more that these young men struggle to be free in America, like the erased bodies of their past, the tighter the noose will choke. So what's talking about obsessions, um, you and I, when we were seeing the piece earlier today, and I told you, when we were actually talking um, about the city and then Stranger's Fruit. And I told you, you know, actually one of my obsessions is I am convinced that there are lynchings of Mexicans or Guatemaltecos or Hondureños or Salvadoreños that are happening right now, today. And I mean an actual lynching with a noose. Um, I'm actually trying to find that story. So if any of you may have any ideas, please get in touch. Very seriously, I am, I am convinced that this is happening today. And you and I had never talked about that. No. Um, and it is uh, almost like an obsession of mine because I am sure that this is happening. Absolutely. You know, I think that not only is that occurring, but, you know, what really piques my interest is the ways that it's, in, it's, it's happening and it's happening right in front of us without us really being fully aware of it, right? And... Um, it was important to um, actively engage each one of these male figures in my studio. Each one of these individuals is somebody known or connected to me personally because the majority of these nine uh, individuals had no idea about their own, this subject, their own history. And so portraying them in the studio in these paintings made them um, willing participants in the rewriting of their own narratives. So speaking of um, the city, let's go back to that. Sure. Um, and the kind of prescient, that's why I keep asking you, like, where was it that you understood that this, because it's so prescient. I mean, we now talk about white supremacy. We talk about structural white supremacy in a way that we were not talking about it in 2015. And, um, and so one of the things that is in the painting is the torch. 
And everybody here, you know, you say torch and they're all going to say Charlottesville. Sure. You didn't know. No. <laughs> and then you, when you saw those images, what went on for you? Well, this is by far the, um, probably the most surreal experience I've had in the studio um, in terms of my own interaction with, this, with the artwork because never before had I been creating a painting on this monumental of a scale, um, you know, and every day that I woke up and turned on the television set or opened my, my computer screen, and then I'd walk down to the studio and I was seeing these things happening and they were coming to life. And so it really kind of kept skewing my perception of what I was doing and who I was looking at. And so for 11 months, this turned into the longest staring contest ever recorded, right? I mean, there was a staring contest. It was almost as if um, both parties were waiting to see who was going to flinch first. I was as curious, I became as curious about them as they were about me and I, was, I feared them as much as they feared me. I love the fact that as an artist, you're, you know, engaging with your subjects um, and that there's a level of curiosity. Um, one of the things that I do love about hyperrealism is when it's done really well, then these particular details have real meaning. Sure. Um, and so it's weird for me to say that I actually really wanted to look at all of the particular details like the cell phone that the man is holding the light emanating from the cell phone, um, the women with their manicured nails and their dainty jewelry um, and their long blonde hair, um, and then, of course, the child with the upside-down Pikachu and, um, and his Nike, baby Nike tennis shoes. Um, and when we were talking, you were saying, we have to understand that people who are members of the KKK or who believe in white supremacy structurally and in their lives, they are around us. They're every not, day, you sure. know, they're, they're, they're around us, they're everywhere. They use cell phones um, and they drive you know, Chevrolets and, uh, and they, they can be our neighbors and they can be nice to us too. Sure, I mean, I think what disturbed me the most was the idea that, um, that these were ordinary, citizens and human beings no greater or no lesser than I, right? The, presenting them in ordinary acts was my way of stripping them down of their power so that they were at my eye level. Um, there's something more disturbing to me about the idea that this is present, right? And so this is what I was trying to achieve. The idea that they are pre presented as a family unit, as a community, as a, as a clan, a group, a gang, right? And so the details are in the story. And for me, Maria, like those details are everything because I, it's my way of walking myself into an experience, of setting up an experience for the viewer so that I walk you in there with me, right? Um, the details like the, the fingernails and the clothes and the, the sheen on the satin, well, that's the stuff that I've spent a lifetime committed to developing my skill and my craft. You know, when I think about my painting heroes like Leon Golub or Caravaggio or Velazquez or Goya, it was these striking, beautiful renderings of the everyday world and the human situation. And so by presenting this in reality, full-blown raw reality, it is supposed to hit you. I lure you in with that beauty and I keep you there just enough so that you aren't um, mm. distracted within two seconds and back on your cell phone, right? So that if I can keep your attention and draw you in and keep you there, then that's when the power of art really starts to unfold because you start to think critically. I mean, I'm convinced that this is why there's always been a war on art because the artist have the potential to push the envelope and to tell the truth. This has always been the case, right? And so when you think about the stripping down of art education, right, the, the, um, 
the way that art is sometimes in modern day society are sometimes cast aside as like, well, they're, you know, they're poor, they're celebrities, and they're just sort of hobbyists. I mean, there's, there's a real truth to still be had. You know, I, 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 I don't think that a single painting can change the world in an instant, but I hold very firm in my belief today that art and artists can still play a social role and that art can provide very crucial, critical moments of silence and reflection during moments of immense distortion and chaos. So one of the things that really has helped me, apart from meditation and boxing, has helped <laughs> me get through this particular time is when somebody said to me, actually my husband, he said, you know, some of the most amazing art was produced under the most challenging circumstances, yep. whether it was World War II or in the United States in the late 1960s when, you know, where our country was literally, you know, splitting open. And, um, and I do want to give props to, to the Blanton and to the entire team for choosing to make a very risky move by acquiring this painting and showing it. Did they? They did. Okay. I was like, <laughs> I was like, wait, I think I read that. I know it was a lot of money. Um, so, no, no, but seriously, like, um, it's a very risky move. And I think part of what this moment is challenging us um, as Americans, we're all being challenged, right? Um, we are being put into really difficult circumstances and it means that a lot of us are having to take all kinds of risks. Sure. Um, and so to me, what I love about this particular risk, about this particular museum showing this particular work is that in fact it has opened up a possibility for us to talk. And to me, talking and dialogue is the core of democracy. Sure, absolutely. So it's like, you know, you're an artist, you're in your studio. It's not like you're thinking, hmm, how can I impact democracy? I mean, <laughs> I, I actually, I think you are, because <laughs> you're a little bit obsessed with this issue, right? Not like a lot of artists, but you are. I'd so your dream came true, dude. Like you like inspired like a lot of dialogue. Well, there's still those days where I just daydream about painting portraits of my weenie dog someday because it'd be much easier. <laughs> cutest, <laughs> cutest little dog upstairs in his little box. Barking away. <laughs> I want that dog. No, <laughs> seriously, would you like to actually be painting? No, because look, I, I, I think uh, <laughs> I mean, she's gorgeous, but... You know, but would that bring you joy? Like, because there is an element of, I mean, Caravaggio, right? I mean, it's like, it is that element of technique. So is there a part of you like, like, yeah, I could paint my little dog. No. I could paint the <laughs> hell out of my dog. You know, in, in, in an ironic and very twisted way, you know, I say it with the most, with the utmost sincerity and honesty, that one of the few things that I have in this life that presents me with true freedom is making this work in the studio. And I always go to sleep thinking about um, the words of the wise words of Dante, who said, the hottest places in hell are reserved for those who in times of moral crisis maintain their neutrality. <laughs> because you don't have to make a 40 foot painting, right? But little things, it's the little things, speaking up, taking a stand, defending someone else, right? Just not it's it's way it's far too easy to carry I remember reading this amazing story from this um, elementary school teacher in the 1940s somewhere in America and she did this experiment with her classroom and she walked into this second or third grade classroom and she accused one of her students openly of cheating on a test or stealing or something and he said I didn't do it and she started asking everyone around him, did he do it? And they all started saying no. And she said, be quiet, he did it. You're all lying, stay quiet. And then she, she um, went back to her desk and then five minutes later she stood back up and started up on him again. And she said, come outside. Well, she informed the student outside what was going on with this experiment and she walked back in and she said, uh, did he do it? And all the kids were saying, no, we saw him, he, he, he was fine, he's innocent. And she said, don't, you're, you're all wrong, stay quiet, I demand you. And the second that they all cowered down, she said, do you see how easy it is? Mm -hmm. How easy it is to instill fear in people enough so that you don't speak up? 
And for me, I always remember that because I thought it is that simple. And it starts at that early of an age, right? And so it's the little things that can just spark like a wildfire. It's not the leaders, the political leaders, and it's not, the, it's not even the masses when you look at the history of movements in this country and globally throughout the history of humanity, right? It's the individuals that decided to turn the other way when everybody was moving in one direction. And it sparks interest and inspiration in others. And that's, that's it. It's that simple. But it's one, it can be one of the scariest things in the world, right? But I do think that what you're saying is um, you want us to be okay with being a little bit uncomfortable and having uncomfortable conversations because as an artist, you are showing us your own uncomfortableness. Absolutely, yeah. I agree. Um, it's far too, look what happens when you're too comfortable, right? So every time that we ask this question, how did we get here? How did this happen? We were too comfortable to notice, right? And um, now I'll keep that, I'll keep that discomfort <laughs> for now. Um, it's important to me. It keeps me motivated and keeps me working and moving, um, you know, and, and it, it really, it really helps to me to keep a sense of clarity. So I wasn't planning on asking you this question, but suddenly. Uh -oh. <laughs> so do you know any members of the KKK? I don't, but... Um, that you know of? No, <laughs> that I know of. I, uh, but I do... <laughs> He's laughing. Uh, I'm actually being serious. So... So one of the things is, is that, you know, the FBI actually, post 9-11, the FBI has become whiter. Um, just like the news media, post 9-11. And the FBI, um, we, we interviewed a former FBI agent on In the Thick, which you should all subscribe to on your phones, our politics podcast. Um, and he is white, he went undercover into the KKK and white supremacist organizations. And what he said was that basically the FBI, mm, they don't really see this as like, as they a, see this as free speech. Right, right. Black Lives Matter, mm, problematic. Need a police presence, need to investigate them. They're, you know, revolutionary. This is an issue of free speech though. And I just find that, and, and I find that interesting because um, ultimately one of the things that this FBI agent found is that, you know, the members of the KKK are in fact our neighbors, our coworkers. They are there. They have understood a way to blend. Infiltrate, in. um, mutate even. I mean, now we see things like um, the alt-right, right? And the... Uh, you know, neo-Nazis have been around for quite a while. I don't know any um, members of the Klan, but I, I, there's a story that I've been keeping to myself for the, and waiting for this moment tonight and s that I thought I'd share it. When I was about 16 years old, I had um, my only, according to my dad, real job. Uh, um, <laughs> Pouring a Dude, you're working it. <laughs> Papi should be very happy at this point. No, my dad's here. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, wait, where's Papi? Oh, oh, come on, stand up. Come on, stand up. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So all of you who have artists, sons, and daughters, support them. Yes, yes. Take lessons from Vincent's dad. <laughs> I, I like riding him. Um, and so I was working at the EMC movie theater one summer, and uh, I quickly saw that I was no good at pouring nacho cheese on people's nachos, so I convinced the managers to let me paint murals in their <laughs> workers' facilities, and so I was. And one day, I was coming out of River Center Mall, which is in downtown San Antonio on the Riverwalk, and I saw police tape. And I didn't think anything of it, because that was my main exit to get out and... and um, and go home. And so I went right through the police tape and I found my, which let you right out into the uh, front of the Alamo. And then I realized like, what the hell's going on? There's all these people and screaming. And I, I, re I realized very quickly that I was standing face to face at age 16 with like a grand dragon in a hood. Now, 
he had a hood with the top, but the face was exposed, like cut out, and he was tall, and he had a beard, and I remember we just stared at each other, which seemed like 10 minutes, but it was probably three seconds, and there was this confrontation where I stopped dead in my tracks, and he stopped, and we just, he stared down at me, and then I noticed that I started looking beyond the, over his shoulder, and I, I thought, what is wrong with this picture? And there was tons of people yelling and throwing things at them, and then there was tons of um, clan members in hoods marching around in a circle around the pavilion of the Alamo. But what really caught my attention was that there was a police line right in the center of both parties, both sides. And every single one of those police uh, men were black and brown, right? And I remember that really was another one of those episodes throughout my lifetime where I thought it really forced me to re-examine, like, who am I and where am I? Where do I fit in in this place? Right, because this is my hometown and I had never felt before this feeling of like, I don't belong here. And so it really, that, the idea behind the city, you know, I, that was so deeply embedded and etched into my memory that that's the confrontation in that city, that moment where two sides collide and you, f you run into each other. Now I know what gave you the inspiration. Sure. Thank so, you. Sorry. That was the first <laughs> question I asked you? It'll be <laughs> like 45 minutes ago? But I got the answer, because that was it. Yeah. Because seriously, I've never had that experience in my life. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've interviewed white supremacists, um, but I've never been face-to-face -face with a man wearing a KKK hood. Yeah. I mean, and it, you have. Yeah. So I think that was, in fact, etched in your mind sure. in a way. Um, so I want to talk about boxing, but... I just wrote down this other issue, sure. which is not about boxing, <laughs> which is um, a really delicate part of the conversation, right? But you, um, again, as, a, as an artist who is not afraid of, of conversation and of risk, it's a conversation about black and brown, actually. Um, this piece, in fact, inspired part of that conversation. Um, I think that... Uh, you know, there there was an element of like why you know why why paint them as opposed to the victims, you know. Although you have, um, and also the importance of being a Latino who is actually interpreting this part of American history because we have. I mean, I just put it out on my Twitter. I was like, you're talking about this from a Latino perspective because. Latinos and Latinas have been affected by white supremacy and the KKK historically as well. Sure. Centered clearly on a hatred towards black bodies that runs so deep in this country. Eh, they're shooting black men today, right? Police are right. unarmed and they're being found not guilty. Right. So that is happening today. Yeah. You know, I, for, for me, it was, you know, in terms of a historical context, it was extremely important in the research that I was doing at the beginning stages of, the, of that painting and of other series. You know, when I look back at, when I tried to dig around into American art history, I mean, I, I could not locate um, an example where a Mexican-American or Latino um, has um, been provided a platform whether it's in terms of art or, or even politics and mainstream media and society, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big gap. And creating this painting and, and others uh, like it in terms of the subject matter um, was my way of inserting myself into this long legacy, not only of painting, but of um, artists, American artists who over uh, the ages have stepped up and addressed um, subjects like racism. So I'm thinking about Philip Guston, who really inspired me again with his 1960s paintings of Klansmen. I'm thinking about the poet and activist Gil Scott Heron and his song The Clan from 1983, the album Able, uh, uh, Angel Eyes. So Val Valdez, Guston, um, Gil Scott Heron. Right? Here are, here's a solidarity right, of three various Americans, three different ethnic backgrounds of three various, three different generations. And the question that I left remaining was, uh, how many more Amer American artists after me 
will be forced to address subjects like racism in America. How much longer and further will this continue? One of my heroes, actually, um, as an American journalist, is Ida B. Wells. Um, I don't know if you know her story. No. Ida B. Wells is an African-American woman from Chicago. Well, originally from the South, and then it was in Chicago. And as a journalist um, in the 1940s and 50s, she decided that she wanted to, to document and write about lynchings. And because of that, she was labeled un-American, right. unpatriotic. She was shunned um, because she wanted to write about this. And people were saying, it's not news. If there's a lynching, it's not news. And, um, and the fact that it is, um, you know, it is a mission in journalism, like in art, to actually say, no, 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 it is news. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you this story, even if you don't want to hear it, sure. and I'm going to fight to tell you this story. Sure. Can you tell me about the boxing? It's gone here. But yeah, we can go back. We can go back. Oh, we can? Wow. <laughs> so what up with the boxing? Because boxing has saved my life, All apart right. from the meditation. I know. It's like <laughs> boxing and meditation. Um, and I actually, I, I, when people would say boxing, I'd be like, huh? <laughs> oh, what a horrible, I've never watched a boxing match except for Muhammad Ali and Frazier. Wow. That yeah. was like a billion years yeah. ago. <laughs> um, but now I box three times a week. Awesome. I'm so excited when I found this, learned this about Maria because I said, other than my friend Mickey Klein, I never get to talk about boxing to anyone else. And so I'm very excited. <laughs> Forget the clan boxing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what up with boxing, though? Why do you, because, yeah. Well. So I, I began um, using the symbolism of, of the boxer as um, a narrative in my work when I was at RISD in the last semester of my work. I, I had this stupid dream of being like a flyweight champ what? Uh, dad <laughs> dad you immediately got on the phone and said no vincent se te ocurre. he didn't even tell you right was, yeah. and so I, I joined this little boxing club and very quickly <laughs> I, w I found myself there was no like weight. with the nachos there thing you were like nah, <laughs> yeah there was there was no weight division so i was finding myself like up against like these six foot two irish guys and i was like oh man my hands and so i decided to quit the boxing <laughs> and I did it on paper instead. And so... And save your hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so the idea was that, you know, what I love about boxing is that, you know, it was once coined the poor man's sport. Mm -hmm. So it's such a representation That's why I like it. <laughs> of the immigrant in America. It was the golden ticket. And so, for example, in this series titled America's Finest, here was my counter to an early, when, in, you know, those first few years, like probably under George W. Part Two, um, uh, when the, the anti-immigrant rhetoric began uh, in the media. And so this was my way of showing the Americans who really have built this country, right? It wasn't the Rockefellers and the Carnegie Mellons in terms of labor, right? And so here are, here is this multitude of Various American males, each standing guard over what's most sacred to them. The Black Panther that's been skinned and sold as a rug now at Ikea, right? The Chicano fighter who stands guard over his own funeral wreath that reads Ni Modo, which is um, equal, translates to like too bad, so sad almost. Um, never last on his shorts. The Anglo white American who stands guard over um, mm. the few pennies that are tossed at his feet mm, mm, mm. with a sinking ship on his forearm as a tattoo that reads, this too shall pass. Mm. The Native American pierced with his own arrows, reminiscent of um, Cassius Clay Ali on that cover of Esquire after he had been stripped of his boxing license for refusing to serve in Vietnam. But then going back further, right, St. Sebastian, here are the Americans, and then it ended with this image titled Requiem, right? The collapsed eagle, the ultimate symbol of power, of glory, and patriotism in reverse. When do we ever see or consider the eagle as being something vulnerable, fragile, and even breakable? Hmm. And, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I could sit here and talk about art with Vincent forever, but we do have some people who are here in the audience. Um, that was your cue. <laughs> we got a, a few people here and probably a few questions. Um, and for that, 
we're going to get some help. First, All right. A round of applause for that amazing. Thank you. Um, so I, we are not going to pass around mics, um, so speak up, raise your hand if you have a question. I'm sorry, it's a little blinding, but I will try to get to as many of you as I can, and I'll repeat the question if, if folks can't hear. So I see one in the front. You. You. Yes. Um, hi. I was curious to know how you chose the brands that are featured in your art. She asked, how did you choose the brands that are featured That's in your That's a great, great in the city? question. In the city? In the city. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's important to address um, consumerism, right, in marketing and media and how it's advertised and the power and the history of advertising uh, in America. Um, so I, I'll, I'll pinpoint it down to like the Chevrolet insignia on the truck, right? It, we all identified as Chevrolet. But if you look carefully, you'll notice, uh, I was talking to Maria about the light source, the most powerful light source that's tying that entire composition together. 35 feet of it leads you right back to the to that cross insignia. So, you know, of course, you, we think about the burning crosses, right, utilized by the Klan. But if you go a step further, I always remembered the slogan of Chevrolet in commercials in the 1980s when I was growing up, the heartbeat of America. And I remember as a kid, always staring at the television box and thinking like, how come I don't look like any of these people on these shows? I don't look like the Brady Bunch, you know? And that family is not like my family. And so that always rang a bell with me. And so. The insignias, the Nike, the, the, the mm. Chevrolet insignia, those are very, very important Budweiser. factors. Budweiser, can that reads America. Um, the slogan that year when they released that actual can, I think about three or four years ago, the Olympics read, um, this is, America is in your hands. And they printed the Bill of Rights on it, mm. right? Um, and this was like a patriotic beer. That's the way they wanted it sold. Did you have another brand? Was that, was that good? The Nike. Sure. Well, I love the contradiction, right, of like the baby wearing these Nike shoes while sporting the the Klan outfit, but these shoes are made by Vietnamese somewhere, and they're probably Air Jordans underneath as a you know flying underneath that shoe. And so the contradiction of capitalism, right? Um, we're so quick. I mean, we're seeing it now, right? In terms of business and economics, we're so quick to condemn other nations and other people, but yet keep bringing those products in, right? Keep selling and making that bank. And so that really was a, an important part of, of the narrative of that piece. Great question. Great question. Yeah, you in the middle. Thank you. So, comedy question. Um, I read the New York Times post about this, um, and as a black activist organizer here in Austin, coming from Houston, I just want to say, um, I really appreciate the fact that we have black and brown artists doing this type of work, uh, especially in cities like Austin where we have this veil that we're this progressive liberal city that we all get along. Wait, you don't? You are? <laughs> Wait, what? Just kidding. <laughs> and and um, I, that's a whole hour conversation, but I, I just want to, you know, it was some stuff in that New York Times article that um, I just want to say as a, as a black man, as a black person in America, I appreciate you for putting this out so we can talk about it, so we can be uncomfortable, so we can get to a better tomorrow. Um, and I think that's necessary. Democracy, basically. Like, you, you love democracy. You know, like in these times, like, uh, I, you know, personally, I feel as an activist that's been doing this for 18 years now, I feel like all I have left, left is hope, art, and music. So the moment we start censoring art, it's just like, yeah. you know, I can't even dream of that. But my, my question um, to you about the painting, the, the thing that sticks out most to me is the, is the, is the child. Um, and I have my thoughts about what that means, but I just want to hear um, why you felt it was so important to have an infant in, in, in the attire at the Klan rally or, you know, whatever they were doing. The, the child was by far the only figure in that entire piece where I had to question whether I was going to include it or not. Um, but I made the decision very strategically. I felt it was extremely important because it, of the fact that it, I knew it would alarm, it would probably alarm some people more than the actual subject of the, of the painting, right? Because the idea of the purity and the innocence of children and how sacred we hold, we revere them. But it's such a harsh truth. The idea was that you, 
nobody, none of us are born this way. You're not born to hate. You're not born to be violent. This is taught. This is passed down. This is embedded in the, into um, one's way of thinking. And this is how subjects like racism are entirely recycled generation after generation. And that's the plain, simple truth. Um, and so I knew that there would be many people that may not see and consider anything else but that child in that outfit might startle people enough to really think about what that means. And I mean, children right now, the whole conversation around children, children who are being ripped apart from their parents. Um, and then I think some of you may have seen um, what I think went viral, which were like two nine-year-old, really adorable white boys who were talking right. about how Mexicans and gang members were coming and taking everything and they needed to build the wall. And you're just like, you're nine years old. They're imitating what they see and what they hear. Thank you. Yes, you in the third row. Um, could you talk a little bit about the significance of the city too? And the, Thank you. The That's city the one two. that always gets overlooked. Would you? Do you want to? So, well, we talked about it, right? So, the city too is the the one right before. Right. The the trash pile. It's the trash pile, mm -hmm. um, and and but I thought it was that was one. It's two. That's two. Uh, a pile, we, I, I actually had a very grotesque ref, ref, reference to this, which was, you know, st things get so ugly, like with a pimple that you've just got to burst it. And it's kind of like, this is the grossness of the pimple, of the horror of, of our, of capitalism, really, just like the throwing away of stuff, yeah. right? But talk, talk to us why, what's the role of this? Because this is so, has no human beings in it whereas the other one is completely different. Sure, so you know, this is several layers, I think, that um, it was the way that I um, approached it. You know, it can be the idea of the haves and the have-nots. There's the golden promised land down below, right? And then the outskirts, everything else that's been left behind and discarded as a result. It is, um, when I look at the, uh, eroding, the erosion in the soil, the mud and the polluted sort of toxic sludge, that, you know, doesn't, I wasn't necessarily addressing, addressing the literal pollution of our environment, although you could see it that way, but it's really about the erosion of America's ability to confront a truthful mirror, right? The erosion slowly, the chipping away um, of our democratic freedoms, of our democratic ability to converse, to think. Um, and so the idea was that this becomes a stand-in for the, the masses, the population. Um, here is uh, the idea where we see um, what has been sort of left behind, right? I, I'm, I'm not sure if I've clearly articulated that, but you know, for me, what I love, what I think is most powerful and effective about this image is that it's so not unliteral, right? It really has the most mystique for me out of the entire um, work, you know, including the other panel, because there is so much interp to interpret here. And I love the idea that so many people have, seen, have interpreted this in, in so many different ways. Yeah. All right. Sort of in the center. You're next to each other. You, you go uh, the one long hair first and the short hair second. <laughs> um, I have a question about what you envision on the other side of the city line. Um, it looks like all of the members of the Triple K are looking at something, like something has caught their attention. Do you envision that as kind of you when you were a little child and you came head to head with kind of that same experience? I mean, that was a sparking point for it, but no. I mean, I think for me what's most important is that they are confronting you, right? And after you walk away, they're confronting the next person that steps up, right? Because this is my way of saying, it's time to step up and face the truth, right? Um, it is, uh, it's painful for America to look into a truthful mirror. We're so good at avoiding it. Um, and we have a long, long history of, of um, avoiding looking at our self-reflection. Great question. Yes. Um, I think one of the points that Maria made about as you paint these, you're unveiling these characters and you're looking at them. That's just a chilling thought. But what about the man who doesn't have the hood? And he 
He's staring you in the face. He's got a gun, I believe, on his back. That's an AR-15. How do you handle the risk of that character not being masked? And does that not haunt you even more? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, there's a, a hierarchical, hierarchical order in the lineup. And so he, because of the eagle emblem, um, I think they call them Kleagles in the clan. And uh, so he is the one sort of keeping order and making sure that, you know, sort of doing circles around the lineup. But it was my way of saying slowly the disguise is coming off and, they are, and this is being exposed. Uh, it's time to expose it even further, right? And so that was, but it's, a, you know, it's a, again, it's, it's, it's haunting the media in 2018, the day to see like in the media, this is now just an image in almost everyday newspaper, you know, and, uh, but it was really important to see a little bit of that face to say like, um, you're watching, um, you're watching us, but you're being watched. We are becoming more aware of this. And I, and I think it's really an important detail. So Jorge Ramos, um, actually did a documentary uh, about hate. It's on HBO. And um, Jorge actually presents, could present more as lighter skin white. So he goes into a KKK right. meeting, um, but he never speaks because if he was to open his mouth, then they would hear his accent and that. So he actually comes in, he's like a kind of part of the crew, but they film a KKK rally. Um, I think it's in Indiana. And they're like in the middle of the day and there are kids walking around. They're not in hoods, but it's a rally. Yeah. So it is in fact happening right now. Sure, and I think right now what we're seeing is like the hood's not even necessary. People are feeling really confident. Charlottesville. Just like, yeah, Charlottesville. I don't even need the outfit anymore, right? And so it's amazing how this painting has evolved very quickly <laughs> over the past three years. Yeah. We have time for like one or two more questions. Marilyn, I saw your hand. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, my question, I had her question about the unveiled, and when you told the story about being 16 years old, I kind of thought, was that the image, but he doesn't have a beard. But I also saw a hand that looked like a Hitler salute. Sure. Very good, right. She's asking sure. about the hand that looks like the Hitler salute. Right. right, so one hand he has the America beer can, laser pointer time, right in there. And so the idea was that absolutely could be interpreted as that salute um, or he's waving to the camera like this is they're photo bombing the city the landscape right mm. it's almost like they jumped in and were like cheese uh, and so but more significantly was the the baby's hand because you know we all are familiar in some way you know you've seen babies interact and they're moving their fingers and trying to point and so the idea was that it's a toddler but at the same time He's pointing at you. You know, it's reminiscent of Uncle Sam's I want you, right? And so it becomes this further, deeper statement about Americanism. I have a question. Okay, yes. Sorry, we'll get the woman in the middle and then we'll get you after. Thank you. Sorry. Marcus uh, Valdez, I hope I am not giving voice to this, but have you ever thought about what does a clan member think of what you paint? Yeah, That's great a good question. question. She asked Because there, there has been this concern, right, that mm -hmm. For some people, you may be, in fact, celebrating a great moment for them, and then they're going to come into a museum and say, wow, here, here we, we are, are. Yeah. on the walls. I mean, I, I thought about it when I was creating the work. Um, I don't know that I had a definite um, response to it. You know, I, I knew that once this work was put out into the world that, you know, that might be a possibility. Um, you know, and, and I... Uh, I'm not sure that I, you know, of course I would love to um, think that perhaps they might be um, somewhat enlightened by the piece and maybe rethink, you know, like this guy turning around, he's the only one that's breaking away and sort of reflecting on who he is and where, where he's at and what he's doing. But I can't, I can't make that promise, you know, and so, you know, it's... Um, once these things leave the studio, it's, it's really, they really start to take on a whole entire life of their own and they quickly evolve into something else. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but in all honesty, I don't know that I have an answer. Okay, the gentleman in the back, yes. Sorry. I just want to say thank you, Mr. Valdez, for coming. I really appreciate your work. Um, I definitely think that conversation needs to happen. Um, as a young artist myself, I struggle with putting my work out, and I think that comes from 
uh, just systemic injustices. A lot of times in art class, I remember a teacher erasing my work before I remember, even as a young writer, I see some of my teachers that say, like, I'm not a good writer. Um, right. so They'll say that all the time, by the way. <laughs> Don't listen. <laughs> It's okay, sweetie. We know it's very emotional. This is really when you are owning your voice. So we're here for you. Thank you. Um, basically, what advice do you have for us? This is so important, but we don't we don't talk about it in the classroom. So, what advice do you have for us to our work out so we can be someone like you, someone who can really change the conversation? Thank you for your question. You agree? Yeah. You're going to get double answers. Go ahead, Maria. Go for oh, it. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm yeah. just, uh, you know, usually I'm making the people cry. What's up with that? <laughs> um, and thank you for crying, actually. I think it's really important because it shows how deeply you feel about this. And this is, there. there's a lot of, you know, at the core, um, we're human beings, right? We're, we're, we're deeply human um, beings and we're emotional beings and we're spiritual beings and this means a lot especially if you're an, an artist find your people um, and those may be your fellow students um, greatest artists around um, some of them were bo born with a silver spoon but many of them not and they ha had to find their collective fellow artists to support them and make them believe in themselves and, um, and especially now, the beauty of this moment, I would say, is that part of the dialogue is for us to own our voices. That's what Vincent is doing by doing this work, is that he is saying, this is my art, this is my expression, this is me. And so um, part of what I'm doing in the journalism that I'm doing is, this is what I do, this is, this is what I do, and, I, and I'm gonna do it over and over again. It's a kind of a mission. And so don't feel like you know you have to be the success right now and that you have to have the answer right now and that you have to, it's a long process but we need you engaged, we need you um, committed um, and we need you convincing yourself at every moment to believe in your voice. And sabes que, like I totally believe that you're gonna be a success whatever because you stood up and you were like, I have a question. I was like, okay, that's all right. So you made yourself be heard by using your voice and the fact that you stood up and the fact that you said, I have a question. And then the question that you asked has moved everybody in this entire auditorium. What's your name? Juan. Juan? So Juan, um, what you need to know is you need to own the power of this moment. What you created, not here, very important people, Somebody who asked a question right up here is on the board of directors of this museum. With all due respect, she didn't make everybody cry. <laughs> and you did. And you did. That means that you have an artist's touch already. Don't ever lose it. What she said. Yeah. <laughs> All right. One no, one. If, no, go ahead. If, if it helps, any. When I was in school, I had a professor who said, "Stop doing this work. You will never sell a painting. Nobody cares about these stories. Wow. This is not relevant." And she kept true to the RISD creed because she lit such a fire under my ass. I was so <laughs> determined. But my bit of advice to you is. It's so important. One of the most beautiful but most challenging things of being an artist is learning to trust your instincts, mm -hmm. right? You can't, nobody can teach you that. No art school, no writing professor, a YouTube tutorial cannot teach you that. That comes from in here, right? Right in here. And there's always gonna be a lot of noise. There's always gonna be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of distortion, but the more and more as you grow older and wiser, you will start to 
learn to navigate through that noise and learn to listen to your heart, right? It's one thing to create through your hands and your eyes and, and hear, but your heart is a whole other entity. Mm -hmm. And I trust you, if you trust it, it will grant you the access that you need to just be who you need to be and say what you need to say. So stick with it. Don't ever back down, no matter who says what. It's not gonna be easy, but it is possible. So all the power to you. Okay. <laughs> this, this woman is brave enough to follow yeah. Juan, so we have to let her ask her question and then we'll end with you. But yes, go ahead. You, yes, yes. <laughs> So, um, I just first of all I want to thank Nelson Linder from the NACP for inviting me to this. I am just, I am, I, I can't tell you how brilliant I think you are yes. and how yes. I have learned so much today. I'm an executive director and founder for a nonprofit that works with people that have gone to prison mm. and their families. And I think one of the things that caught me the most were the depictions of the males with the tattoos and the Things on their back, I could really, I could really, I could feel all of that. But I want to just tell you that I have learned so much here tonight from you, and about your passion and your heart to even say this out loud, and just how you have learned your craft. You knew who you knew, the artists that have inspired you. And so, uh, if this is the only job that you have, <laughs> <laughs> you have to this. And to one, I just want to tell you, I say this a lot, and it's my saying. Keep going. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, before we leave, I, uh, I have a special little something for you, Maria. It, it's such an honor and a privilege it really was my dream to meet this woman and to be able to share a conversation and ideas with her. And um, so there's something that uh, myself- God, You guys, you're making me cry <laughs> twice, come on now. <laughs> Stop you, this. You, in all seriousness, you are doing important, ah. important work mm -hmm. and we need your voice. Mm -hmm. We need you more than ever. So thank you, like I really thank you. Um, I, I have been working with my good friend Todd Wydell for the past year um, to uh, create a project of shoes where we, he is going to feature um, uh, the artwork um, on these shoes. And so I found out your shoe size. Oh um, my God. Oh my God, my assistant said they want your shoe size. That, I forgot, I was like, that's crazy, who cares? And so know that these shoes, the company, it's titled Save By is um, what it's titled, what it's called. And um, every, eventually when we launch these things, every pair of shoes is going to help to fund young artists across this country. Aww. Oh my goodness. Oh my God, thank you so much. It's a sinking ship, but you know, that's the thing that's gonna yes. keep me motivated to never give in. <laughs> never give in. Thank you so much. Um, if you ever catch me wearing these, it will be a very special day because um, everybody meets me and they're like, oh my God, it's so nice to meet you. And then they're like, but you're so ridiculously small and short. So I only wear six inch heels in public. So these I will wear in the airport <laughs> so I can run. <laughs> this is so beautiful. Thank you so much, sweetie. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us.